Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, so Dr. Brokaw said that everybody needs to get 30 minutes of exercise a day, so Elise and I are in cahoots to get, make that happen. So can everybody just stand up one more time for me? Does that feel good? It's like minute two of 30, done. Okay. <laughs> all right, stretch out, take a breath. So now that I have you all standing, I want you to do me a favor. And anybody who, I want you to keep standing if you ever lost somebody that you love in life. Everybody else can sit down. All right. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> I definitely wasn't expecting everybody to keep standing. Uh, now I want you to keep standing if you lost that person or you lost somebody that you loved before you were 35. Everybody else, sit down, have a seat. Do exercise another day. Okay. <laughs> now I want you to keep standing if one of those people was a parent and everybody else can sit down. Hey. Well, hey guys, I'm Rebecca, and you might have noticed that I'm still standing. I don't have a seat, but I'm standing here on purpose, too. You guys can sit. Thank you very much. Now, I not only lost one parent, but to boot, I lost both, which makes me an orphan. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but when I think of orphans, this is kind of what comes to mind. You know, it's like, Please, sir, may I have some more? You know, like this literally comes to mind. I'm a big musical theater person. So, um, but the thing is, is that when it happened to me, I actually looked something like this. Like, no big deal. Normal. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. And you have to bear with me because I'm used to telling this to like small groups of friends who I know really well and <laughs> not like groups of lots of people who I've never met before ever. Um, it all started on Labor Day, which for me was a very magical time of year. It was always the tail end of my family's camping trip in upstate New York in Lake George, deep in the Adirondacks. To me, it's the most beautiful place on earth. It's the place I was going with my family every year since I was two months old, camping with them, going back, no matter how crazy the world got every year, no matter how nuts life became, every single year I could come back there. It was my constant. So it was Labor Day on 2006, and we wrapped up our camping trip, and we packed up the boat and packed up the car, and headed back down to New York, where my parents dropped me off at my apartment. And they came upstairs, and we hugged and kissed and said goodbye. And, you know, it was not really that big a deal. I was going to see them at my cousin's wedding a couple days later. And then they got in the car and headed, back, headed south to Philadelphia, where I'm from. And by the way. That's me and my parents at Lake George. Very cute, wasn't I? Um, they headed back down to Philadelphia, where I'm from. And an hour later, I was sitting on my sofa going through email, and the phone rang. There had been an accident on the turnpike. There was something in the road, and the car had swerved. And it flipped over, and then flipped over again. And my mom was thrown out, and she wasn't OK. And I raced south to be with her at a hospital in Princeton. And the entire time, I knew in my gut that when I got there, I was going to find out that she hadn't survived this accident. And when I got there, that's exactly what I found out, that my best friend in the world was dead. And four years later, I was on my sofa again, going through emails again, and my husband came home, which I thought was kind of weird, because it was like 11 AM on a Friday morning. And his face was gray. And my dad had had a heart attack late the night beforehand. And he was traveling abroad and didn't survive that one either. So there I was, orphaned. Now, I'll never forget the moment that it really completely hit me, the fact that I was a real orphan. It was right before the holidays, and I was on Facebook, and everybody was talking about plans and like what bar they were going to go to back home in Philly, because we all just met up on the holidays. And I realized that for the first time in my entire life, there was literally nobody at home waiting for me to show up. I mean, there was nobody making sure that I got in OK, or got in at a certain time, or was there for dinner. No one cared. And I suddenly felt this profound sense of being completely untethered 
from everything. The nucleus of my life had completely imploded. I felt like I was free-floating through the universe. Nothing before me, nothing after me. I was totally reeling. And it's not like it was that easy to connect with people who just got it, you know? I mean, obviously, I love my job at the Colbert Report, obviously. But it wasn't the ideal landscape for doing some deep grieving, so I had to compartmentalize a little bit. And I loved my friends, and they loved me. They were awesome people. I mean, I think they loved me. But half the time, they had no idea what to do with me, because I actually had no idea what to do with myself. I had no idea what I needed. And I went to a grief support group for people who lost their parents, and guess what? I was the only person not in AARP. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's awkward. Um, I went to therapy. Great. But I still felt alone. I went online. I found a lot of gently flickering e-candles, and I found the DSM-4, which, like, talk about <laughs> Pandora's box. I would, like, self-diagnose with, like, all these maladies, and <laughs> when instead, I just couldn't recognize that what I was going through was just extremely normal and very, very deep grief. And it's not like I was a kid going through loss. I know I wasn't an adolescent, but, you know, I was at this point in my life where I still had all of these life milestones ahead of me. I mean, I still wanted to get a dog, get a mortgage, find a husband, make some big career decisions. That's a lot of life left. And I reached this really bleak moment, and then I finally made a decision that I wanted to stick around. And when I made that decision, I also realized that, you know what? <laughs> I wasn't willing to keep living a whole lot of mediocre life just because I wasn't going to be able to tag the people on Facebook that I thought I'd be sharing all of those experiences with. And so as much as I thought it was completely unfair, and I totally did and I still do, I realized that I was going to have to be the one to go about retethering. Nobody else was going to do it for me, as much as I really seriously wanted to outsource that job. So here's what I did. Last November, I launched Modern Loss along with my friend and fellow lady in loss, Gabby Berkner. Modern Loss is a storytelling site with a very strong backbone, a candid storytelling site with a very strong backbone of practical resources for what I think are navigating these very messy, murky waters of living life after a loss. So we, want, we run a wide variety of original, very high-quality first-person essays on experiences. But you know what? Did you just get married? And do you have like a father-in-law that you're having trouble getting along with and you, your own dad died a few years ago? Or do you need a little hand-holding before going through a dead friend's closet, which is like the crappiest job ever? Or you know what? Do you need to, some advice from a financial therapist? Like, those actually exist. Did you know that? Uh, before, when you have an inheritance and you're feeling all of these like, overwhelming feelings that you didn't think you were going to feel. So we've got all that. And we've got all that because our goal is to demystify this process, which is still very you know, mystified, to create a word. And it's a process that has a very long arc. It's lifelong and it has endless triggers along the way. And also what we want to do is show you that, you know what, if loss happens to you, you're not broken, life isn't over, even if you think it is. And it can actually be surprisingly rewarding. So, you know, it's not like I grew up dreaming of being a poster child for loss. That would be, like, really creepy. I had other things in mind. But it is what it is. <laughs> we started something that didn't exist for ourselves in the voice and tone that we needed, which was kind of uplifting, kind of snarky, kind of tongue-in-cheek, and we created it. And when we launched the site, we thought we'd spend like the first week futzing around and correcting typos. I mean, we just like really just threw it online. But within one hour, we were on Slate magazine. I still have no idea how that happened. Within a month, we were being interviewed for the front page of the Sunday Style section of the New York Times. And in between, we received hundreds of story submissions from people all over the English-speaking world with their personal experiences that they were so eager to share as a cathartic experience. People from everywhere, I mean, they particularly like talking about loss in Canada, if anyone is interested. <laughs> really like it in Canada, particularly like Montreal, dark place. Um, but 
these were stories that for some reason, people who had, who had you know, their networks of their own, they felt more comfortable sharing these experiences through our platform as opposed to with their closest circles because they didn't know how to broach the subject. So as a result, I have learned exponentially more about the true loss experience than I ever did before launching this project. And I'm very humbled and very overwhelmed with gratitude for that experience. And I'd like to share a couple of the things that I've learned. First thing is that, <laughs> shocker, given tonight's theme, people really, really do not like talking about death in this country. They just don't. So by the transitive property, they certainly do not like talking about grieving and loss. You know, I think the most of the time, the onus is on the person going through loss to make everybody else in the room feel comfortable. It's like, it's okay, no, it's okay, I'm fine. But you know, you're not fine, it's not okay, and that's okay. It's so uncomfortable that you know, this discomfort results in friendships becoming estranged because one person doesn't know how to be there for the other. Or, you know, first dates abruptly ending in like extreme awkwardness. Or an employee's discomfort in asking for just a little leeway during a rough patch from a manager. And in terms of, you know, what people say, there's a wide variety of highly entertaining and inappropriate comments that I've culled from our readers here behind me. Um, they're, they're fantastic. They're all true. Last one, true story, can you imagine? At the funeral. Um, and these things, as you may not be surprised to find out, only end up isolating the person that they're offered to. And, you know, or, or making them feel like something is wrong with them if their reality isn't as tidy as the person saying them wants it to be because they're so uncomfortable. You know, I don't think that people say these things because they don't want to be helpful. I think, actually, I believe in the inherent good of humanity. But it's just not a part of our national conversation, of our culture, to talk about loss, talk about grieving. And so this is what's said. And, you know, sometimes this is what's done. <laughs> You're welcome. I know you guys know what this is. It's a sympathy bouquet made of melons and marshmallow and some chocolate-covered strawberries. I received 14 of them the week that my mom died. 14. Now, look, fruit is delicious, and it's not processed, Dr. Brokaw, so she would approve of it. But you guys, I truly believe that collectively we can go deeper than this. We, can, we really can go deeper than this, because the spoiler alert is that loss is going to happen to all of us. I mean, every single person in this room stood up. That's, that's shocking. It's just going to happen to some of us earlier than others. It's OK not to know the right thing to say or the right thing to do. Sometimes admitting that to somebody is actually the best thing that you can do. And knowing that, you know, Loss isn't some magical 365-day period of time where grief is the deepest, you know, you're at your darkest moments, and like on day 366, you look in the mirror and everything is kind of lighter and there are like cartoon birds flying around. It just doesn't work that way. It's 365, 24-7, for the rest of your life in some ways. And yeah, you know what, guess what? You can also remember that big events, sometimes they can suck. But you know what also sucks? Thursday nights when someone is just sitting around wishing that their girlfriend or their daughter or their husband were there to watch bad TV together. Now, the second thing that I've learned is technology has thrown an interesting wrench into this whole loss and grieving experience, and as well as provided all these different ways for us to open up the conversation. So, um, when I wouldn't even, on the upside, I would not even be standing here today if I hadn't been part of launching a project, an online project talking about loss, right? So that's a fantastic thing because modern loss can reach people anywhere in the world where they have a device and an internet connection and it can draw someone out of their isolation. Fantastic. Also, Posting something on Facebook or on a social media channel, it's really great. It provides somebody with instant gratification, like instant e-comfort. They can post a photo of someone they miss, post a comment online, which in turn can get comments and likes, and like, that's really fantastic, I have to say, it is. But the thing is, on the flip side, that 
the internet is this like wily little place, right? Where, you know, it's still the Wild West and it just kind of lurks and waits and launches these sneak attacks on you at like 2 p.m. on a Thursday when you're at your computer at work and you're on Gmail and it asks, asks you, are you sure you don't want to add your dead friend John to this email? Or you go onto Google Earth and you look up your childhood home address and you see a satellite image of your dead father mowing the lawn. Or in the case of one of our contributors, you find out that your dad died in a car accident earlier in the afternoon. And by the time you log on to Facebook, you actually find out that the entire town has known about it and has felt free to share it online the entire day. And yeah, I think that it's really kind of tough to figure out where you know, death fits in between burritos and babies when you have an unfiltered stream such as this rendering behind me. But what I do know is that no like can replace a conversation. Although I would like to make a gentle plea for the Facebook empathy button, <laughs> if anybody is interested. Now, the third thing that I have learned <laughs> is that, and this is meant to be reassuring, is that no matter how messy your situation is, and no matter how isolated you feel in your own reality when you're going through loss, I promise you that somebody else out there gets it. Somebody else out there gets it, I promise, even if you haven't met them yet. Loss is messy. It's a total shit show. Sometimes there's no closure. Sometimes there's resentment. Sometimes there's relief. You know, and sometimes there's guilt associated with feeling that relief. But I promise you, you're not the only one out there feeling that. I promise you that, guess what? Someone else out there is finding out that their hot scuba diving husband was also the hot scuba diving boyfriend of several other women before dying in an accident. Or is trying to figure out the perfect word to define themselves after a long time gay partner dies, but they weren't married. So are you a widow? What are you? Or is like a little bit relieved and feeling guilty for it because a really difficult parent passed away? or is getting an email from the school district reminding them to sign their daughter up for kindergarten when she died three years beforehand. And I've had my own share of this mess in my experience since my parents died, and that would require a whole lot of time and lots of heavy alcohol, and I will be in the lobby and I'm available afterwards, so <laughs> come up to me for that one. But the thing is, is that I've also had my fair share of highly unexpected happy moments as well and I want to leave you with one of them. <laughs> this is my nine-month-old baby boy. Isn't he so delicious? <laughs> it's my first time away from him. Um, and this picture was taken a few weeks ago, and it was taken in Lake George on the campsite that I grew up camping on my entire life since I was two months old. And it's a picture that in a million years, I would have sworn to God would have never existed after my parents died. I was totally certain that this photo would never, ever exist. So as you can imagine, nobody was more bold over than me that the entire day I smiled from ear to ear. And ever since, I have been daydreaming about taking him back. And that's the biggest lesson that I've learned through this entire Mishigas, like this whole lost thing, which is Mishigas is like craziness in Yiddish. Um, I feel like there are Jews in here. But which is if you're somehow the most empowering and healing thing that you can do for yourself after being slammed by loss, slammed and slammed again, is to somehow, somehow figure out a way to let go of how you were certain or you thought your life was supposed to play out and instead embrace the phrase, it is what it is. And with that, the good news is we have all survived this evening on death. So I sincerely hope that everybody leaves tonight and goes and makes the most out of the amazing lives that you guys have left. Thank you. Thank you.